So I have finished reading White Knight, which is Dresden book nine, I believe. And this is the spoiler chat for it. So spoilers. Uh, so I've been reading through this series. I've been doing one a month, I think. The first, when I first started it, I read the first three books back to back to back, and then from there I've been doing one a month, and I recently have switched to doing spoiler reviews, so that's what this is going to be, but it's not going to be nearly as long or nearly as extensive as my last spoiler review was because I just didn't enjoy this book nearly as much. Um, in, after the last book, I started tier ranking the books, and so I've just continued on with that, and that's my ranking. Uh, with White Knight added. It's, it was fine. I didn't dislike it by any means, and it did have two scenes that I absolutely loved, um, but beyond that, it was definitely not a standout Dresden book to me. So because of that, I will happily chat with you about it, but I just, I'm not gonna have as much to say. Everyone is down on pain because they forget something important about it. Pain is for the living. Only the dead don't feel it. So this book starts off with a series of suicides, that's what it looks like, but upon further investigation, it's clear that this is not a actually, actually a suicide, this is in fact a serial murderer that is doing this and covering it up uh, through magic. I loved the beginning of this book, um, the first two chapters I thought were really, really good of reintroducing Murphy, letting us know where she is in her job now after the events of the last book and how she feels about it, how her and Dresden's relationship are doing, as well as Molly, <laughs> who's now our apprentice, her being invisible and on the crime scene. The scene where Murphy tackles Molly and, uh, <laughs> and just like tackles the, the air, uh, but catches her and Molly's like, how did you know? And they go back and forth. Um, uh, it was a squeaky floorboard when no one was standing there. Your deodorant, I could smell it. The, your your tongue ring clicked against your teeth. The There was a gust of wind that I felt and they just like, they went back and forth tell, telling her what her tells were. You're not as clever as you think you are. And it was a really good introduction to Molly as well for seeing that she really has advanced in her control over her magic, but she hasn't really advanced in her maturity yet. She still has a lot to learn. She still isn't thinking about the consequences. What happens if this ends up being uh, tr uh, considered a murder and now we have to do fingerprint sweeps and they'll find your hair, they'll find your prints, you touched things, like you are incriminating yourself unnecessarily by showing up to this crime scene unprepared for how to manage the crime scene. So I really liked that. Um, they did a good job of showing where she is magically and where she is mentally and how there's still a disconnect between what she's able to do and how far ahead she thinks and how much she considers the effects of what, uh, what she does. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Molly's progress. I'm very, very attached to her character. I'm very defensive <laughs> of her character. Um, I just, I want to, I just want to take her under my wing. <laughs> just take her out for coffee. Let's go. We're gonna, I'm gonna take care of you. That said, chapter three. Oh, I hated that. Um, so Molly has, she soul, she soul connects, she soul gazes with a corpse. And because that corpse died super happy, supernaturally, extra super duper happy, um, Molly essentially has a mental orgasm in front of Harry and, uh, and Butters. And they both watch and then Butters is like, hey, is she above age legally? And Harry's like, yep. And he's like, cool, I don't feel so bad about watching this then as she's like groaning and moving in certain ways. And it was just, I mentioned in my last, um, in my last review that I, do, I didn't like certain scenes that happened in the last video and uh, and not because they were present, but because of the way they were executed. You can watch that video if you haven't yet. And I mentioned that if that was the only time this sort of thing comes up, fine, we, we'll move on. But if this is gonna be a pattern in these books, I don't know what I'm gonna do because I don't enjoy seeing Molly being put in these very sexual positions, situations, and having Harry, who watched her grow up, and this is his best friend's kid, like, I don't like this dynamic. Thankfully, this is the only scene in this book like this, but please tell me this stops. <laughs> One of my favorite things about these books is how the characters interact with each other. It's the relationships between the characters. And this is a dynamic, Harry and Molly, uh, master and apprentice, that I want to love. And I do love a lot of what's happening 
but I don't love this element of it. But I am loving uh, the Harry Molly dynamic in many ways. Harry's really challenging her. He's really trying to push her to mature and to understand the power that she holds and how everything has consequences. Um, the scene, oh my goodness, where he had the fire and he was like holding it up to her, pushing it closer to her. He's like, stop it, stop it. In a battle, the guy who's against you isn't gonna be this patient. You'll already be burnt up. Stop, stop what I'm doing. And she couldn't do it. She was freaking out. She was panicking. She didn't have the control to be able to stop him on the spot. And he even had this, this impulse, this desire to push it a little bit closer because nothing teaches a lesson like being burned, like a burned hand. And there was just this, this anger in him, this frustration at her not getting it and wanting to push it a little bit further, but holding himself back. And even Murphy in that scene was like, okay, we're gonna talk about that. And like she was, she was very unimpressed with the way he handled that. There's definitely a lot of progress happening between Harry and Molly in their apprenticeship and in what's going on and him really pushing her to mature um, because she is, she's very immature in a lot of ways. She's viewing the world through a very immature lens. So she, I mean, she has to grow up if she wants to wield this power and she does. She keeps tagging along when she's not supposed to. She keeps pushing boundaries that she shouldn't be because she feels like she should be able to do more. She should have more liberties. And Harry has to teach her, you don't get these liberties until you learn some responsibility. So I'm really liking that side of their dynamic. The, the plot really wanted me, the book really wanted me to, to suspect Thomas. I didn't for a second. He's been built up in a certain kind of way that if we are going to have conflict between Harry and Thomas, it's not going to be like this. It's not going to be, okay, Thomas is feeding again and like also killings are potentially on him. Um, so I am glad that they quickly kind of realized okay this isn't thomas he's actually working with us he's actually trying to protect these girls on the boat um and then we were able to move on from that but in general i was really excited to get more thomas in this book and i don't think that i got as much out of him as i wanted to i suspect him okay i don't okay but what's going on what's the secret you're you're working at a salon okay which that final scene in the salon was funny but i just i was hoping i was excited to have him in this book and i he didn't play a huge a huge role. He did play a role though. Elaine is back, which adds a really interesting dynamic because Harry has such complicated feelings about her with her being his first love, his first kiss, his first everything. And so he is still in love with Susan, but it doesn't change the fact that there's a lot of history there and there's a lot of chemistry there. And so that's a really interesting dynamic. I don't think I trust her though. <laughs> I mean, I really like having her in the books, but I don't think I trust her. I, I feel like there's going to be a reveal coming that she's 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 going to betray him, I think. Laura is ruthless and manipulative. She played a really interesting role in this book, and Harry essentially promised her at the end of the book, I'm I'm going to make you pay. Like I'm I'm not I'm going to make you be held accountable for the things that you're doing. So, I expect to see her again, and I'm excited about that. She's a pretty interesting character so far. We also got more of Rodriguez and I I don't know how many books he's been in but we've gotten a few key scenes with him and each scene I think I, I just like him more and more so I'm excited to get more of him. I really liked the role that he played in this book. He's a very likable character. Um, Marcone is a great character. Oh my goodness. He's clearly a baddie, right? Like he does terrible things but him being in power is better than someone else being in power. It's like, it's almost like the lesser of two evils sort of thing. Like you're, you're not cool, but you're also not straight evil. Like you're not just the worst and you need to be dethroned and you need to be executed. You need to be taken out of the equation because you're a net negative to the world, but like you are bad. It's so, I, he's he's a really fascinating character because I do think that he is redeemable, but he is also despicable. Do you know what I mean? He's a character that I'm really enjoying the grayness of, or rather just that he's not strictly a, a bad guy 
with no redeeming qualities. There's a lot that is complicated about him and about the position that he holds. So I'm really enjoying him a lot. Of course, I always enjoy seeing Murphy. I love Molly. I love Thomas. I love Mouse. So lots of uh, lots of characters that are just I are enjoyable to have around. Harry too, I think, was probably the biggest kind of development that we got in this book. Seeing how uh, how his actions are being pitted against him and being misunderstood and the way people are viewing him and how that is affecting everything as well as how his anger is really building up you know he's getting a lot more we're seeing a lot more ruthlessness from him and that he's he's just becoming a lot more cutthroat i think one of the best scenes of the book was the flashback to the warden training camp uh where the ghouls just did they took these girls and it was the scene was terrible um what harry came on and that he just like he executed one he was just like you don't deserve life after this right and i feel like in previous books i mean we've seen harry we saw i think it was in deadbeat we saw him kill someone without a trial without an attempt to you know do a go through the justice system he was just like you're dead now and then we saw the repercussions of that in the following book and kind of the fallout mentally for him as well as externally and then in this book we're seeing more of that so we're definitely seeing harry as a character change and shift and even murphy calling that out and and calling out hey you're getting you're getting too angry you it's getting too much i think harry always kind of expo is exploring a lot of what's going on inside of him um and like what he's going through but in this book i think there was even more of that which was cool um and then there was the ending the big bombastic huge ending with ghouls and a bunch of characters uh fighting together portals like it was wild probably the biggest final battle of the series and it was really well written and i really enjoyed it but i think because i wasn't near nearly as invested in this book. I wasn't nearly as invested in the the stakes of the battle, if that makes sense. But I will say that Lashiel, holy cow, her sacrifice at the end was incredible. Was incredible. The scene where Harry was, where he was telling her, he was convincing her to be her own person. What if I never pick up this coin? And she is begging him, pick up the coin. <laughs> like, I don't want to disappear. I don't want you to disappear. I don't want us to, I don't want our end. And he's like, yeah, me either. But still making the choice that he believed was right. But she sacrificed herself for Harry at the end of this, proving that she has become her own person, that she has gained her own personhood, her own will. And she made her own choice, her own choice of sacrifice, not of selfishness. And he dug up the coin at the end and gave it, returned it to the church. So she's gone. She's actually gone. Is she gone forever? I mean, there's more opportunity, right? Okay, let me... Let me know if I'm understanding Lashiel's character correctly at this point. So the the real Lashiel is in the coin, right? And when Harry touched the coin, an impression of her or like a version of her was imprinted on his mind. And that's what we've been engaging with this whole time is not the truest Lashiel, but an impression of her that has been able to shift and grow alongside Harry, which is why she was able to gain her own free will because Harry like infused that on her. Like he names her and interacts with like a distinct identity of what he's interacting with. It gives her access to free will. It lets her be able to shift and change where the original Lashiel maybe couldn't. And if he had touched the coin, then then what he's been interacting with would shift into like the truest form of Lashiel. Am I getting that right? So with all that said, there seems like there is still a possibility of Lashiel coming back because, <sighs> am I wrong? But it is interesting because free will should be just a human thing. It should be a strictly human thing. And she was given the choice and she used the choice. And I think that tied really in with you know, what the book was doing as a whole, talking about the lesser of two evils, talking about choices that we make, talking about the effects we have on the world, consequences to our actions, and 
making choices that are hard, that are difficult, that are selfless, um, because it's the right thing to do, which is what Harry is continually doing with the choices that he's making. He's making all kinds of choices that are not maybe his preference or not what he desires or what he's tempted to do, but he's making choices because it's the right thing to do. And there are some difficult things that come with that. He's constantly getting into trouble because he is doing what's right instead of what's convenient but he's also getting benefits from that like for instance the situation with laura when he kissed her and then she would have overtaken him and she probably would have killed him and she wasn't able to do that she got burned up because he was still protected by the love uh, bond that he had with susan because he hasn't been with anyone since susan so he makes a lot of choices throughout the throughout the novel, some of which protect him and some of which end up being causing more problems for him. But at the end of the day, regardless of how it affects him, he's trying to do what's right. And Lashiel gaining free will, gaining the ability to make that kind of choice for herself too, I thought it was a really powerful moment in the book. Probably, probably my favorite scene in the book. Anyway, we got mentions of the outsiders again. I guess the outsiders are a member of the black court. Seems like their goal is to disrupt everything, to just like upheave the order of things. I don't know, I could be wrong. Um, so that's got to come back as well. There's a lot of things that happened in this book that I didn't exclusively find satisfying in this book, but that probably are important for future books, like things that are going to come back and be built on. So reading this, it feels a little bit like a bridge book. It feels a little bit like you know, it was fine. There's a lot of things happening, but really just two scenes that kind of were just like, wow, I loved. And then a lot of okay stuff. I don't know if this is going to be an unpopular opinion. I don't know how you rank the books if White Knight is widely considered to be a great book or if it's, you know, fine for me to have this opinion, but this is my opinion. It was one that uh, was okay. Another quote I really liked, we're all human. We're all of us naked before the jaws of pain. Anyway, there you go. Those are my spoiler thoughts for White Knight. I don't usually do spoiler reviews for books that I kind of feel middle of the road about, um, so sorry if this wasn't super satisfying, but since I committed to doing spoiler reviews for Dresden from whatever point forward, I wanted to be consistent with that uh, so I didn't have holes in the reviews. So there it is. What did you think of it? Did you like this book? Did you love it? Was it kind of middle of the road for you as well? I'd love to hear from you in the comments. I'll see you again soon. Bye.